Our scripture reading this morning is in Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Exodus 2, verse 11. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. He said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to the father Reuel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. And she gave birth to a son, and they called his name Gershom. For he said, I've been a sojourner in a foreign land. Thank you, Jeff. Keep your Bibles open, Exodus 2. We're going to be spending our time there this morning. But before we begin, I want to just remind us that next Sunday is a really important Sunday in the life of our church for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's when our elder nominating forms are due, our nominations are due. So if if you're thinking and praying about someone to nominate, uh, we would really love to have a couple of men join our elder team this year. And uh, so I encourage you to be prayerfully considering that this week and bring those forms back next week. And also next weekend, we get to meet Brock and Angela Bytart. Um, I got to tell you this morning, uh, as we went through this search process, uh, we went through a number of resumes and this resume popped to the top. And our team, our search team, was 100% unanimously enthusiastic about this particular candidate. We're really excited to, for you to get to know him and to meet him. Uh, this is a very gracious couple. Uh, they're a couple who's very fruitful. They've been discipling people. They've been uh, doing a lot of uh, work in counseling. They've been effective and, and fruitful in their ministry. And what's really cool about this is that... Um, Oh man, a while back, quite a while back, when the elders started working on a job description for this position, we actually wrote a job description for an associate of discipleship and biblical counseling. And then we stepped back and went, oh boy, that's too much. It's too much in one job description. And so then we had to wrestle with, are we going to focus on discipleship, are we going to focus on counseling? And we wrestled back and forth as a team for several months over this, really diligently wrestled with this for several months. And we landed on discipleship. That's the umbrella uh, that under which counseling falls. It's the, it's the big commission of the church. We'll make disciples. We want to really grow in this area. We believe that would be the best focus for us. And as we went through this process of searching for a pastor of discipleship, uh, God brought this young man uh, along who fulfills not only our current job description for a pastor discipleship, but actually fulfills the original job description we wrote for both. 
That's pretty incredible. And uh, they're not strangers to our church. They actually attended our church for a short time before they moved to Indiana while they were in transition. And I think you'll find there is a sweet, sweet spirit, uh, uh, a, a common spirit among us, between us. And uh, we want you to get to know them next weekend. That's our goal. And so there's several opportunities for you to do that. Uh, our ministry leaders are invited to come here to the church at 2 o'clock on Saturday. We're going to have a special discussion, interaction time to talk about, uh, let him help him get to know our, our ministry and what our ministry leaders are about and, and for you to get to know him in, in some specific ways. And then 5.30 on Saturday, we're having a food, family, and fun night. Uh, what all does that include? You'll have to find out. All I know is that Doug and Lisa are working hard to make this a uh, fun time as well as, so this is really a time for us to come together as a church family and we'll get to rub shoulders and get to interact with Brock and Angela and it'll be, it'll be a fun night. There's some good, good things to show up for that there's going to be a couple surprises, so uh, come and be a part of that. And then next Sunday on, at, during our Sunday school hour, Brock is going to be sharing his testimony. You will not want to miss that. And we'll get to know him in some further ways as, as Chris Callahan interviews him during that time, whatever time we have. And then Brock will be preaching next Sunday. Um, and then we'll have a fellowship meal after church so we have some more time to rub shoulders. And we're going to do a lot of eating next weekend. So, uh, so gear up. Pace yourself uh, this week because we're going to have a great weekend next weekend. I'm so excited for that. But right now we're going to turn our attention to Exodus chapter 2. Let's pray together. Father. I'm amazed at the God you are who takes us in our brokenness and uses us, shapes us and molds us and, and works in such a way that is for our good and for your glory. That's just amazing. And I thank you, Lord, that any of us who come today who have struggled, any of us who come today who have failed, any of us who come today who have sinned can relate to what we're going to discover in your word today. We need it. We want it. So Lord, today, Holy Spirit, will you come and, and do your work, your work, Lord God, your work by your spirit through your word in us. This is our, this is our desire. We ask you to help us want to want it. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, we left our study of Exodus a couple weeks ago in chapter 2 with the birth of Moses. Because of Pharaoh's edict to kill the Hebrew boys, um, the baby boys in Egypt, Moses' parents had hid him for three months only to be discovered by Pharaoh's daughter of all people who took him, uh, pity on him and adopted him as her own. What a turn of events, right? I mean, I had a roommate... One summer, wasn't my favorite roommate, but he used to always say, uh, you never can tell what's going to happen when you get up in the morning. That was the one helpful thing he said to me all summer long. <laughs> we'll skip the other rest of what he said to me all summer long. But you never can tell what's going to happen when you get up in the morning, and, and I'm sure Moses' family could never have guessed what happened that day when Moses, yikes, got discovered and then was taken in with compassion to Pharaoh's court by a gracious daughter of Pharaoh's. And this meant that Moses was raised in Pharaoh's palace and as Acts 7.22 says, he was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was mighty in words and deeds. That is, he was an educated and skilled man. He was a gifted man. There, was, there were a lot of things about Moses that just stood out. Now, we all know Moses as the great man of God who to, to deliver, uh, used of God to deliver his people from slavery in Egypt. So we might expect that, you know, from our human perspective, we might expect that God would use Moses' education and, and his adopted standing in the palace to prepare him for just that. In many ways, that's true. In many ways. God was blessing Moses with various skills that would be invaluable to his eventual leadership of a million people in a wilderness. 
Yet God's ways are so much different than our ways. Amen? I hope you really believe that. I mean, it didn't sound too convincing. God's ways are much different than our ways. Amen? I mean, this leads to a lot of mystery and perplexity in life and a lot of joy a lot of times as well, right? God's ways are much different than man's ways. And before Moses would become a great man of God, before he would become a leader in God's hands to deliver his people, Moses would need to learn to suffer some hardship that would humble him and help him become the kind of man that God could use for his glory. As we unpack chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, We're going to discover a now 40-year-old Moses. So we just kind of skipped ahead, right? He was born, got drawn into the palace. Now he's 40 years old. And he has a great heart for justice. Something that God put in him. A a heart for justice and yet a short-sighted way of getting it done. Right? And as a result, chapter 2 records a major failure in Moses' life. There could not probably be a greater failure. A major failure. A failure that would bear 40 years of consequences for Moses, but nevertheless become an instrument in God's hand to shape Moses into the man God wants to use. It's not the sin itself, but it's what God is doing in the aftermath of the sin in Moses' life that's going to be turned to something remarkable. We're going to see... Here is some really practical encouragement in today's passage. God may use our failures as a tool of blessing in our lives to free us from our spiritual independence, that is, to free us from just doing things our own way when we humble ourselves and allow God to have His proper place of glory in our lives. This is amazing. Church, there's no other God who does this. None. You can read all the major religions of the world. You can read all the cults of the world. You can read all the weird things that people have dreamt up. There's only one God in all the world who will take the, who will take the failures of His people when they humble themselves before God and take that and reshape it and mold it into something usable and God-honoring. Pick up the story in verse 11 now. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people, looked on their burdens, and saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. We know from chapter 1 that that the Hebrews were being ruthlessly driven in hard labor as slaves to build fortified military cities for Pharaoh. This is, this is bad. I mean, it's really bad. It's as bad as slavery gets. They're working in the rock quarries. They're throwing picks all day, dragging stones. I mean, it's, just, it's rough. It's hard work under ruthless slave masters. And then one day, Moses decides to go out and see uh, for himself the condition of his people. You know, he's been in the palace. He goes out to see the people for himself and uh, by the way, notice here, it, it's his people he goes to see. This indicates that Moses here is identifying himself with the Hebrews. That's who he's identifying with. And to his horror, he observes an Egyptian beating his Hebrew slave, presumably for not meeting the slave master's expectations. Maybe even something minor. Right? I mean... Uh, that's the way it happens in, 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 in slave countries, right? Where minor infractions can lead to major repercussions, right? So Moses did something, and catch this, it was probably somewhat impulsive, but it was also premeditated. <laughs> both. Can you do both the same? I, I think so, because Moses didn't go out um, planning to do this probably, but when he saw what was happening, notice what he did. He says he, he looked this way and that way. He looked to make sure nobody was watching what he was doing. He didn't want to get caught. He was doing this in secret. He knows what he's doing. 
He strikes this Egyptian slave master. He kills him. He buries him in the sand. Is there much greater, is there, how many failures are greater than murder? Now, it may, not, may or may not surprise you that some scholars actually argue over whether or not it was wrong for Moses to kill this man. Uh, Some say that Moses was acting as God's instrument of judgment to bring about justice in the situation. You know, like the the later judges in the book of Judges. But the law had uh, had not yet been given. We didn't have the law of retribution yet. We know that that understanding of retribution existed long before the law came. We know from the book of Job. But we didn't have the words of the law yet that said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, did we? And See, this this reasoning that uh, Moses somehow here was doing a work of justice is problematic because Moses, even if he understood the law of retribution, which he probably did, didn't follow it. The whole purpose of the law of retribution, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was to to, uh, produce some self-restraint on behalf of the person who was seeking justice. In other words, somebody takes out your tooth, don't take his life. What did Moses do? He saw a man taking a beating and took his life. Now that's not to minimize the beating at all. But Moses went too far. Moses became a self-appointed judge, jury, and executioner. A self-appointed justice warrior. What I want you to see here is that Moses is acting on his own. The only person who told Moses what to do in this situation was Moses. He acted impulsively and quickly premeditated what he was about to do, and he did it. And yet let's not underestimate how complicated the situation would have been in Moses' mind, right? I mean, there doesn't seem to be any recourse for these Hebrew slaves. There was no bill of rights for slaves in Egypt. There was no law to appeal to in Egypt for the oppressed. Perhaps it seemed this was the only way Moses could exact justice. And yet, as we read the larger story, we discover it was not God's way and it was not God's time. Moses is not called to be the deliverer of God's people until chapter 3. That's still coming. Verse 13 tells us that when Moses went out again the next day, after killing this man, he saw two Hebrews fighting. Hebrews this time, both Hebrew men, brothers of Moses. And this is not really surprising that he would discover this because these guys were subjected to brutality every day by the Egyptians, right? I mean, their lives were bitter with violence, which would naturally make tempers flare more easily, even among brothers, right? And again, Moses decided to intervene saying, why are you striking your companion? Verse 14, he answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. Now Moses had good reason to be afraid, did he not? <laughs> not only is he guilty of killing another man, but he's a Hebrew who killed an Egyptian. And in his context, in this setting, that's a big deal. right? I mean, now the word is out, so Moses realized, oh, oh no, oh no. <laughs> I, can't, I, got, I can't hide from this anymore. And if Moses thought the Hebrews would appreciate his justice crusade, he was wrong. Why? Because it's only fueled the problem for the Hebrews. Who would get blamed for the death of this Egyptian? Somebody's going to notice he's gone. A dead body's going to show up. And who's going to get blamed? The Hebrews, and probably the man who Moses sought to deliver. Of course that guy talked. He's trying to save his own skin. If he could point to the guilty party and he was guilty, he could save his own neck. Actually, as Moses says to this guy, hey, 
Why are you striking your companion? The man's answer to Moses was actually a good question, even though it was said spitefully, I'm sure. Who made you prince and judge over us? Isn't this the heart of the matter here? Who made Moses prince and judge over them? In this moment, this is Moses doing. Moses is self-appointed right here. It was not God who had appointed him to take justice in his own hands. God will appoint Moses in chapter 3. But God has not done that here yet. In verse 15, Moses' fears actually become a reality now. His fears are realized. Verse 15 says, When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about this for a second. Pharaoh was probably not happy about having this Hebrew grow up in his palace and eat from his table in the first place for the last 40 years. (laughs) The only reason Moses was able to do that is because the king had more loyalty to his daughter than anybody else. So he put up with her having this adopted Hebrew son in the palace. He wasn't excited about this any more than I'm excited about having a pet rabbit live in my house. (laughs) It's only because of my love for my daughter that that little rascal gets to have me take care of her every day while my daughter's in college. I'm not bitter. No, no. And now this Hebrew has retaliated by murdering an Egyptian. This Hebrew who Pharaoh had put a bounty on when he was a boy, with all the other Hebrew boys, Pharaoh must have been furious. And indeed, furious enough to put a bounty on Moses' head again. So, in two days, here's where we are, in two days, Moses has gone from being a prince in Egypt to a self-appointed justice warrior, to a fugitive on the run for fear of his life. That's a rough two days. Prince of Egypt to a fugitive on the run in a foreign land for fear of his life. So Moses takes shelter in the land of Midian. Now, it's probably not surprising because the Midians had a similar culture, culture to the Hebrews, since they were half-brothers to Israel. The Midianites were were also descendants of Abraham, like the the Hebrews were, the Israelites were, but not through Sarah and not through Isaac. So they were not technically the children of promise. After Sarah died, Abraham married another wife by the name of Keturah, and uh, they had a son, several sons, but one of their sons that they had was named Midian. This is in Genesis 25. By the way, you'll recall that uh, this takes us back to the days of Joseph. Now, it was the Midianites who actually took Joseph down to Egypt when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Isn't that interesting? Well, as he wanders through the land of Midian, Moses finds a well. That's a good thing. He probably needs water. It's also a place to meet people and make connections. He's going to figure out what to do with himself in the land of Midian. He hangs out by this well to see, uh, see what will happen. And along comes um, these seven young ladies. Let's pick up in verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw, and drew water and filled their troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up. I love that. Young man, listen. Moses had made some pretty major mistakes in the past, but this is not one of them. Moses stood up to something that was wrong. That's a man. He stood up, and what did he do? He saved them. He rescued these seven young women, and then what did he do? He watered their flock. He served them. This is Moses' third attempt now to stand for justice. These seven girls had just drawn water for their flock. That's, a, that's hard work, the drawing water up out of a well, enough to feed their flock however big it was. And these bully shepherds come along and drive their flock away and drive them away so they can take advantage of the water these women have already drawn so they don't have to draw water. 
That is a pathetic uh, excuse for manhood, isn't it? So Moses sees this. He's like, I'm not putting up with this. <laughs> so Moses stands up to, the, to these shepherds and drives them away. Notice here, this is, a, just got to point this out. You know, notice here that Moses may have grown up in the palace, but he's no weak, soft palace darling, is he? No, Moses is strong enough and courageous enough and intimidating enough to drive away several men. And then Moses serves these young women by watering their flock. Notice the difference now between uh, this time from when Moses stood up for justice in the past. The first time he stood up for justice, he killed a man with no self-restraint. And that's the key phrase, no self-restraint. The second time he stood for justice and dis- uh, stood and, d- and discovered that uh, his murder had become known, he ran for fear of his life. So we've got the Moses who's over domineering and uh, doesn't exercise self restraint. Now we've got the Moses over here who's running for fear of his life. But this third time, he stood for justice with courage and self-restraint together that resulted in actually serving the vulnerable young women he stood took a stand for. Now these young women were elated. They were so they were so happy. They were so relieved. Imagine them facing this day after day. And by the way, um, well, let's just read verses 18 to 22. When they came home to their father, Ruul, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? That really bugs me. Ruul here, we'll learn later, is the same guy by the name of Jethro. And he's a good guy. Overall, he's a good guy. We hear good things about him in Scripture, but this bugs me. The fact that he says, why did you come home so early today means this is not an uncommon occurrence. Right? For them to come home late because they had to draw water twice for their flock because they had to draw it for the other guys too, who came and drove them off. These bullies, right? What is Raul doing sitting at home when he's got seven daughters out there facing bully shepherds? I don't know, but I don't like it. Well, I'm going to off that soapbox. It's just an, just an observation. He says, what are you doing home so soon? And what do they say to him? They said, verse 19, the, an Egyptian... An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, then where is he? (laughs) Like, have you forgot your manners? I like this guy. I want to meet him. So he tells him, go get him and call him that he may eat bread. Now remember, what did bread represent? What did eating together represent in the ancient Near East? Friendship, right? It was calling someone into friendship he, he wants to get to know this guy he wants to share his appreciation with this Moses guy and verse 21 tells us now kind of jumping ahead says Moses was content to dwell with the man and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah and she gave birth to a son and he called his name Gershom for he said I have been a sojourner in a foreign land Here we learn some interesting details about Moses' life. He got married. He had children. All that went down. He has a favorable relationship with his father-in-law, Raul, who's also called Jethro, we'll discover later. But I want to draw your attention to two specific details here. First, the women identified Moses as an Egyptian. Catch that? Think that's what Moses wants to be identified with right now? Oh, it makes sense. Moses had just come from Egypt where he was steeped in Egyptian culture and most likely was still wearing Egyptian clothing. They could probably maybe hear by how he spoke. Whatever. They, somehow they, they, they perceived him as an Egyptian man. He appears to be an Egyptian. Even though we know from verse 11 he's seeking to be identified with his Hebrew people. In fact, Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 says even more strongly... By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's not who I am. I denounce that. I'm not an Egyptian. That's not who I am. Why did he do that? 
He did that choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses was saying to himself, I'd rather identify with my suffering people, the people of God over here, even if it's going to be costly to me. When he could have had everything as a palace prince. He could have had it all. It's pretty remarkable. But now, Moses is displaced from both the Hebrews and the Egyptians. Who is he? In other words, what is his true identity? He's an ethnic Jew, but he's trained in the ways of Egypt's high society. It's a little bit like a missionary kid who spends his entire life in a foreign country, another continent, and then returns to the States as an 18-year-old to go to college. It's tough. It's tough. It's a really strange experience. I mean, he's an American, but how American is he? He's American because his parents came from the U.S., but that's not the culture he knows. His Culturally, he's more African or Asian or whatever continent he lived on, even though his roots are American. It can be pretty tough. It's no wonder, then, that Moses named his first son Gershom. This is the second detail I wanted you to see here. He named his son Gershom, which literally means an alien there. Or as Moses said, I've been a sojourner in a foreign land. Do you, do you, do you hear the ache in Moses' soul? Do you hear the ache there? He's become a man in exile. Note, who's he going to end up leading for the next 40 years? People in exile. To, in a sense, right? Right? And according to Acts chapter 7, verse 30, Moses would spend 40 years in this foreign place of Midian doing the hard and humble work of being a shepherd. 40 years. He killed a man. I bet there wasn't a day of Moses' life he didn't have images of that bloody, bludgered, bludgered, yeah, you know that word, um, body that he buried in the sand and now for 40 years he's living out in an, in an, as a nomad shepherding animals in the wilderness 40 years okay you know, what is what is the purpose of this season of moses life that's the question i want to ask well what is the purpose of this season of moses life i mean we know what we know what moses did to get himself into this situation But what is God doing in these 40 years while Moses bears the consequences of living as a fugitive for killing a man? God is doing is God is preparing to make Moses into the kind of leader God can use. He's putting Moses through a school of experience. And the first step to becoming a man that God can use or a woman that God can use, the first step is developing humility. Humility. It's the number one trait of a good leader. It's the number one trait of a a leader that God will use for His purposes. Humility. Moses had gone from living in the most privileged status in Egypt for 40 years. Keep that in mind to experiencing the most humble work of his day for 40 years. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's kind of a balancing here that's going on. Moses, is, his life is getting balanced out from privilege and education and all these things he got in Egypt to now 40 years of hard labor and wondering, who am I after all? What is God doing in my life and what's the point of it all? He's being humbled. His Egyptian, you know, God is God is God is preparing Moses by being a shepherd. Now, just think about this: God is preparing Moses far in advance of his calling, which will come later in chapter three. His Egyptian education as a young man included not only reading and writing and math and multiple languages, including including Hebrew and Egyptian, which he would need, but probably also things like leadership 
and administration and military training. That's part of the training that a prince gets in a palace. Do you think that would be helpful for, do you think be helpful for Moses leading these people in the wilderness? Probably, right? Moses would know how to conduct himself in Pharaoh's court. That, that would be helpful, right? He would n- he'd be known by those in leadership. He'd get in the door. That, that would be helpful, right? But now God is preparing him to be able to identify with his Hebrew people who were, be, who were living as foreigners in Egypt. He would become accustomed to humble and hard work. As a shepherd in Midian, Moses would learn how to navigate the wilderness as a nomad. That's huge. You don't take a city boy and throw him out in the mountains, do you? Moses needed experience, and he's getting it. He's learning crucial skills for leading the Israelites in those, for those 40 years in the wilderness. And as a shepherd, God is preparing Moses to shepherd people furthermore moses is learning how to lead a family during those 40 years in a very real sense when we step back and look at chapter two this portion of chapter two we could say that this passage is about moses failure and the long-term consequences of that failure that, that, that's that's really in one sense what the passage is about how might god be working to turn moses failure into something for Moses' good and for God's glory? That's the other question. Because that is the God we believe in, right? And we do know the rest of the story of Exodus, right? We'll get there, but we kind of know what's coming, right? I've already mentioned that God is humbling Moses and providing a variety of experiences to develop Moses' skills, but there's something even more fundamental that I want to draw your attention to. This is really important. God has to get the hero status out of Moses' heart so that he can be a true spiritual leader who is fixated not on his own agenda but on God's glory. It's like training a horse. Horse might be beautiful. Might have the right stock. Strong, healthy, but if it's not bridled, it's not trained God is God is preparing Moses here he's got to get this hero status out of Moses heart he's got to teach Moses there's a better way than trying to do things your own way if you're going to be an instrument in my hand you got to learn to do things my way Moses God would use Moses heart for justice yes He would use Moses' heart for justice, but Moses had to learn that he could not simply take matters into his own hands as a self-appointed justice warrior. He needed to be a man submitted to God. He needed to be a man submitted to God, ready and willing to walk in God's ways, in God's timing alone. In other words, Moses had to learn to get out of the way if God would get the glory. Perhaps this will make more sense if we take chapter 2 in hindsight. Hindsight's not 2020, by the way. <laughs> we're, not even perfect, we're not even perfect at how we see things in the past, right? I mean, but it's a lot better, amen? So let, let's do a little hindsight work here. Let's take chapter 2 in hindsight against the greater backdrop of God's purpose in the Exodus. What was God's purpose? For the exodus, for, for taking the people out of Egypt. What, was, what is God's bigger purpose in the book of Exodus? Well, our first answer is to say, well, God's purpose is to lead the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt according to His promise and to establish a people for Himself that would become a blessing to the nations. That's pretty big. Pretty big. But there's something even more significant than that. Than that. God's ultimate purpose is to display His glory to the world. That's what God is doing. The great God, the Creator, the invisible God, what is He going to do? He's going to reveal Himself to the world. That's big. That's as big as big gets. 
And if God is going to use Moses to do that, Moses is going to have to get over himself. Amen? Easy to say when it's Moses we're talking about, right? I mean, the core and the purpose of the book of Exodus is this. The core message and the purpose is this, that the world may know the glory of Yahweh, the only God, the only Lord. This is so much bigger than Moses, so he needs to get out of the way. And God will use his failure in training ground, as training ground to humbly lead the world to see Yahweh is God and there is no other. Like John the Baptist who said, I need to decrease. He needs to increase. So let's get ahead of ourselves for a moment, should we? Let's get ahead of ourselves for a moment. Let me just show you God's purpose in his own words 14 times. And this is going to make sense out of chapter 2 for us. So what I'm going to do is, you, you pretty much know the story of the Exodus, right? I mean, God um, sends Moses to Pharaoh to say, Pharaoh, let our people go. And Pharaoh says, who are you? Who is your God? Forget it. Uh, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardens Pharaoh's heart. God sends ten different plagues upon the Egyptians. And Far- Harold, uh, Pharaoh keeps getting his heart hardened or hardening, hardening his heart. And <laughs> Hard to say all those. And in the process, finally, Pharaoh gets fed up. He says, get out of here, good riddance. And then no more are they out the door, and he decides that was a bad idea, so he decides to go after him with his army, and God drowns him in the Red Sea. That's the one-minute version of the next uh, 15 chapters. So, that's the story. Now let's see what God's up to. Number one, uh, Number one, why does God call Moses to bring the Israelites out of Egypt in the first place? Exodus 6, 7. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. That's the purpose. You shall know that I'm the Lord your God who's brought you out from under the uh, the burdens of the Egyptians. Number two, why uh, why does God harden Pharaoh's heart to oppose God's commands? Exodus 7, 3 through 5. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Number three, in the plague of the frogs, why does Moses tell Pharaoh to appoint a time for the frogs to be removed? Exodus 8, 10. It will be done as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Number four, why does God tell Pharaoh that he is pressing against him so hard in the plague of hail? Exodus 9, verse 14. This time I will send the full force of my plagues against you, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Try to get the picture? We're not stopping here. (laughs) Number five, why did God raise Pharaoh up to be a king in this place in this time? Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. I've raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Does this have much to do with Moses? Not really. Number six, why does Moses appoint a specific time for the hail to stop? Exodus chapter 9, verse 29, the thunder will stop and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Number seven, why does God continue to harden Pharaoh's heart and send more plagues? Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, I have hardened his heart so that I may perform these miraculous signs of mine among them that, I, that you may tell your children and your grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them and that you may know that what? I am the Lord. Number eight, why does Pharaoh keep stubbornly refusing to listen to the Lord? Exodus 11, verse 9. Pharaoh will will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Number 9. After Pharaoh released the Israelites, why did he change his mind and pursue them? Exodus 14, 4. 
And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army, and the Egyptians will know, here it is, that I am the Lord. Number 10. Why does God drown Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea? Exodus 14, verse 7. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh. Number 11. What was the Israelites' response to seeing Pharaoh's army overthrown? Exodus 14, verse 31. When the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him. You think that glorified God? Think that was raising God's reputation? Oh yeah, right? Verse 12, Moses' song of praise expresses the glory and the reputation of God that, that God deserves. This is in Exodus 15, verse 14. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the, part of the, the, the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab must be seized with will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. Listen here. God is not only glorified when we gather and we sing and we praise God for all the good things He does, God is also glorified when He brings justice on His enemies. That's what's happening here. Where are we at? Number 14. The last one. This is really pretty awesome culmination here. Remember, it was Moses went out to Midian, to Jethro, or to Raul, right? And that's how where this all got kind of got started, this new phase in Moses' life. And now at the end of all the plagues and the deliverance of Israel uh, deliver, deliverance of the Israelites, here's what Jethro has to say. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods let me ask you a question is the message of exodus subtle not exactly right i mean this is shouting to us 14 times god is working in such a remarkable way so that moses the israelites pharaoh the egyptians the nations and the coming generations will know that yahweh is the lord that the world may know the glory of Yahweh. And with that grand and glorious purpose of Exodus to display God's glory, can you see how the man to lead God's people cannot be a self-willed, independent man who's bent on doing things his own way? You see that? God is saying, this is what I'm up to, Moses. You need to get in line with me. This is what we're going to do. It's not going to be about you, Moses. I don't need your ideas, Moses. I don't need your strategies, Moses. I don't need your brute force, Moses. I need you to listen to me. I'm not here to show what a great man you are. I'm here to show what a great God I am. So Moses, take a step back. You've got a place to lead. You've got a job to do. But it's not about you. If God's glory is going to be on display, Moses has to get out of the way. If God's glory is going to be on display, Moses has to get out of the way. You know what? We could take that name Moses out of there and we could put our own name in there. If God's going to get the glory of my life, I've got to take a step back. That doesn't mean I don't do anything. It doesn't mean Moses did a lot. <laughs> he had a hard job. But what it means is it's not about me. And I've got to come to terms with that. And God in His grace will work even through the consequences of Moses' failure in sin to humble him and begin preparing him to be the man of God that he will use rather than a self-made man. Now, listen, all of a sudden, the events of chapter 2 are not merely interesting facts, are they? Right? This is not just like, oh, that's interesting. 
Moses killed a guy and he got married and had a kid. And that's not what chapter 2 is about. I'm not. Chapter 2 is essential to what God is doing. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you, you got to sin grievously to be used of God, right? Well, sometimes, though, a man has to fail to see his need to do things God's way. God may let you fail for your good. Don't discount the benefit of failure in your life. I'll never forget, I didn't understand at the time, I'll never forget one of my mentors when I was a young pastor saying to me, Ty, are you willing to fail for Christ? I don't want that. My church doesn't want me to do that. He's not talking about moral failure. He's talking about, are you willing to let God use your imperfections and your stumblings to help you grow and shape you? Are you willing to entrust all of that into God's hands? Hard question, isn't it? Sometimes a man has to fail to see the need to do things God's way, and what's essential here is humility. Whether we humble ourselves or whether God humiliates us like he did for Moses for 40 years, the road of humility is the only one that ultimately glorifies God. Can we just say at church, it's not about me. It's not about me me here's what i want you to walk away with today i hope so because our life purpose is to glorify god we cannot afford to seize control and seek to do things our own way but we must rather humbly submit ourselves to god's will for our lives sweet surrender a giving up, a yielding. You are God, I am not. Well, that sounds good. What, what does it look like? It looks like not growing resentful toward God when life isn't going your way. I trust your will, Lord. I trust what you're doing in my life right now if I can't understand it or I can't see it. I, I'm here to yield to your will and design for me in my life. And praise God that when we humble ourselves, God can turn our failures into a tool of blessing by freeing us from our spiritual independence to give God His proper place of glory in our lives. This is really sweet. This is beautiful. Church, let me say it again. There, there's no other religion on the face of the earth that preaches this message. Bring me your failures. Bring me your sin. Bring all of it to me. Humble yourself. Give me my proper place in your life and watch what I'll do as a potter in your life with that stuff. <coughs> Hinduism doesn't do that. Buddhism doesn't do that. Islam doesn't do that. Hira Krishna doesn't do that. The New Age movement doesn't do that. Just Jesus does that. John Wesley's prayer captures the attitude of a heart that is poised to glorify God. I want, I want you to take this in this morning. This is what John Wesley prayed. I'm no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. 
I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. That's what God was taking Moses to. Now some of you right now would say, yes. Some of you are saying, yes, that's a good prayer. Oh Lord, help me, help me really want that. And some of you may be thinking, that's not for me. I don't, I don't like the sound of that. I don't want suffering. I don't want to be brought low. I don't want to have nothing. But what if the God who invites you to himself uses all those things for your ultimate benefit and good as well as his glory? I I have a hunch. Pretty strong one. We're going to see it later. When Moses got to the end of his life, I don't think you find Moses looking back over these 40 years and saying, ugh, there's one thing I could rewrite about my life. I'm sure he regretted killing this man. But what these 40 years prepared Moses for was a relationship with God, which was the most amazing, satisfying, awe-inspiring like, no words to describe kind of experience with God. Moses, the guy in chapter 3 who prayed, show me your glory. <laughs> God said, I'm going to bury you in the rocks so my glory doesn't kill you when my holiness passes over you. But he did it. He let Moses see just the, the back of his glory as he passed by. And Moses, shuddering, probably said, yes, yes, that's what my soul longs for. My God, my creator, the one who made my soul, he satisfies me. Whom have I in heaven but you, the psalmist said. I desire nothing on earth besides you. I wish I could say that with all the integrity of my heart, but there's some things on earth I desire. But oh, the joy of getting to that place and being able to say, God, you are it. I'm I'm satisfied in you. I I don't need to be satisfied by food. I don't need to be satisfied by stuff. I don't need to be satisfied by looking good in people's eyes. The one who created me the one who loves me, the one who gave his son to die to redeem me, he satisfies my soul. You know what that's worth? It's worth a season of being brought low. It's worth a season of having nothing. It's worth a season of suffering. As we prepare for the Lord's table today, We have what Moses didn't have in his day. We have a clear understanding of the specific way that God was God that God provided to deal with our failure of sin. What was a mystery for Moses is completely clear for us in the Bible. God provided his one and only Son as a perfect sinless sacrifice in payment for our sin so that God's holy justice would be satisfied and we could be forgiven. I'm going to say it one more time. God provided His one, his only, he provided his one and only Son as a perfect sinless sacrifice. So nothing, nothing to detract from God's sense of holy justice. He was was perfect. It met his standard. And he did that in payment for our sin. Jesus died in payment for our sin so that God's holy justice would be satisfied and we could be forgiven.
There's no other religion in the world with that message. Just Jesus. As we prepare for the Lord's table, we have two really incredible opportunities in front of us today. First, as you humble yourself and confess your sin to Jesus, He takes away the guilt, the shame, the condemnation of your sin, and He replaces it with grace. (laughs) He replaces it with grace so that your heart becomes a deep well of grace that overflows with gratitude. (laughs) That's one thing that sounds too good to be true, but it's true. Right? From guilt to gratitude, from bondage to freedom, from shame to joy, from condemnation to favor, God's favor. That's how God turns your failures into blessing. He forgives you and gives Himself to you. So, man, oh man, oh man, so often we come to the Lord's table and it's right for us to be sober, but it shouldn't be solemn. I mean, we're sober because of our sin. We're sober because of the seriousness of the death of Jesus. But what happens in this moment, in any moment when we confess our sin and we repent from our heart, is that God takes our failure of our sin and He says, now let me, let me change the DNA here. Let me... Let me Infuse that with grace so your soul goes, ah, oh, oh, oh. And we laugh and we sing for the relief of our guilt and for the favor of God. That, that's how good this is. That's the first opportunity. Here's the second one. We have before us the opportunity to extend the very forgiveness that God has given us to others whose sins and failures have wounded us. What a tremendous gift to be set free from bitterness and stubborn hurt. So here's a question for you. I I know you've been patient listening. I know you have. But this is really important. Do you believe that the cross work of Jesus is sufficient for the person who sinned against you? Do you believe the cross work of Jesus is sufficient not only for your sin, but for the sin that you you think feels bigger from the person who sinned against you? Do you believe it's sufficient for your sin of unforgiveness? Jesus said, if you forgive men their transgressions, Your Heavenly Father will forgive you. That's because His grace is more than sufficient for both your brother's sin and your sin of bitterness. More than sufficient to forgive your sin of unforgiveness as well as your brother's sin. And this is how God turns the failures of others into blessing. Bitterness to forgiveness. Bondage to freedom. Resentment to to grace. So let's come to Jesus together to forgive and to be forgiven. There's grace enough. Just before the service this morning, I was talking with Sean Park, and he was talking about a podcast he listened to from a a missionary from a jungle place, and they're translating the Bible into a language, um, another language, and that language... Um, had no word for mercy or what was the other word? Forgiveness. forgiveness. No word for mercy or forgiveness. So I mentioned, I got to come up, I got to figure out a way. I got to figure out a way, to, a way to talk about the concept of mercy and forgiveness. Here's what he did for mercy. You know, a tribe comes out of the bush and they have their bows drawn. The warriors are ready. And they relax the bow. That's mercy. Some of you this morning, 
You need to relax the bow. Take the tension off. Just say, it's not worth it. It's not worth what it's going to cost me to have this fight, to hold this grudge, to be this bitter. And I have good news for you. That's what grace is for. There's grace enough from Jesus for us to be able to relax the bow and let him have his way. Lord God, there is no other religion in the world outside of a relationship with Jesus that could transform our failures into blessing because you're the only God who gives grace. We need that grace now. Oh Lord, I pray for my friends here this morning. Especially the ones who may have carried in with them a hidden weight of failure or shame or sin. Oh God, thank you. We don't have to keep that. Help us trust you. Given it over so you can replace it with grace. Father, I pray this morning that we would, we would trust you not only to cover our sin by your grace, but to cover the sins of a brother or a sister or a friend or a family member who sinned against us. I know it's complicated, Lord. But what we need right now is a heart that just says, Lord, I, I'm going to yield to you in this. I'm going to humble myself before you. So Lord, as we come to your table this morning, would you, would you meet us, Jesus? Would you meet us? You know what work you need to do in us. Help us to simply say, Lord, I welcome your work of grace in me. Amen. Gentlemen, will you come?